That day was just horrible. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. Why didn't anybody tell me I look like this? I was really thinking that my daughter was going to die. I was taken aback. I'd never seen anything like this before in my life. Next, three medical mysteries that defy the experts. Doctors told Adrian Beck that her unborn son may be suffering from a deadly genetic defect, but Adrian refused to give up hope. I just wanted him out. I was so frustrated with all the ups and downs, and I wanted him to be okay. Then, Stephanie Kaplan thought she had a simple case of the flu until she found herself in the hospital on the verge of death. I just remember holding Josh's hand and just looking into his eyes and saying, I love you, and hoping that that wasn't the last time that I would be able to tell him that. And Scott Gober's doctors searched in vain for the source of his unbearable pain until Scott couldn't take it anymore. I felt like there were vampires coming and taking my blood. When illness strikes, we look to doctors to give us answers. But what if they can't? For these unlucky patients, diagnosis is a mystery. fall of 2003, Adrian and Mark Beck, the parents of four children, get some unexpected news. 35-year-old Adrian is pregnant. This pregnancy was very similar to my other pregnancies. I was maybe a little more tired than I had been with my previous pregnancies. At age 35, women run an increased risk of having a child with a chromosomal defect. So in her fourth month, Adrian gets an alpha fetoprotein screening, a routine blood test to detect her risk level. When the results come back, they show a possible problem. I have had siblings who had that same test, and the results came back abnormal, and they were worried for weeks, and it turned out to be nothing. So it was a little seed in the back of my mind to worry about, but I just kind of pushed it away. Although we, we knew there was some potential for problem, we still felt pretty confident that there would not be any issues. Two weeks later, Adrian is back at her doctor's office for an ultrasound, where they learn they're having a son. We were actually very excited, and we wanted to find out the sex of the baby. That was our main concern at that time. But, you know, pretty quickly turned into a pretty dramatic situation. During the exam, the technician starts acting strangely. I could tell by the way he was measuring and remeasuring and taking his time and not talking. Uh, that something wasn't right. Based on Adrian's age and the AFP test, he felt that we were in fact dealing with a baby that had, had Down syndrome. Down syndrome is a chromosomal disorder that causes developmental delays. Adrian is sent immediately to get an amniocentesis. It is the best way to confirm a Down's diagnosis. When they do an amnio, they take a needle that's probably about that long and stick it in. and. It, it almost feels like you're kicked in the stomach for a, just a split second. It's a very weird feeling. But the weird feeling turns to heartbreak as they face the possibility that their unborn son could have this serious condition. I was just devastated, and um, I just bawled and bawled. It kind of began uh, a process of a kind of a mourning of there's this life that you've hoped your son would have and knowing that life is not going to be. The results of the amnio will take two weeks. Mark and Adrian have no choice but to go home and wait. Those two weeks were so long. Uh, every day, you'd find yourself constantly losing focus and wondering how that test was going to come back. Finally, the call they've been waiting for comes. Um, a nurse tracked me down on my cell phone, and she just said, oh, Adrian, I needed to find you. I'm so glad I found you. Then oh, Adrian cute. hears words she never expected to hear. Your little boy is a healthy baby boy. He doesn't have Down syndrome. He's going to be perfectly normal. We were thrilled with the news. We felt like we had dodged a big, big bullet. So for the next three months or so, his life was great, getting ready for this new baby. It was just really fun and exciting. In her seventh month, Adrian goes in for another routine ultrasound exam. And once again, I could tell something wasn't right. At seven months, the baby is more developed. Now the doctor can see more details, and what he sees is alarming. 
They were concerned about uh, the baby's fists being clenched, the length of his long bones, uh, meaning this, this bone here and the long bone in the leg. He then told us that our baby had a fatal form of dwarfism, that the baby would either die in utero or shortly after birth. Because of the history with this doctor and him being so certain that our baby had Down syndrome, I just felt in my heart that what he was saying wasn't true. Desperate to find out what's wrong, they seek another opinion. A new doctor tells them that their son doesn't have the fatal form of dwarfism after all, but he can't tell them what is wrong with the unborn child. We were just so tired of the guessing. Um, it really was just such an emotional roller coaster. A geneticist encourages Adrian to undergo more extensive prenatal testing, MRIs, and fetal x-rays. But even after dozens of tests, she still has no answers. We just decided no more ultrasounds, no more testing of any kind. We were going to wait until he was born, and then they could have him there to look at. On April 23, 2004, two weeks before her due date, Adrian goes to the hospital. We woke up at some crazy early morning hour, four or five o'clock. I was feeling a lot of hope that after this day was over, that this whole ordeal would be finally done. Things seemed to be going well. His heartbeat was strong through the process, and I think we continued to feel like things were gonna, gonna work out. It was going very slow, and then I finally was able to get an epidural, and it didn't take. Then I started running a fever. None of these things have ever, ever happened to me before. And then after about five, six hours of labor, I started pushing. Uh, Adrian worked and labored and pushed to the point of near exhaustion, and the baby's head was just not advancing. And I finally just said, you know what? I need a cesarean. Just get him out. He needs to get out. As we headed off to the operating room, I was just thinking, just a few more minutes, and this will be done. We'll be on our way. So when they lifted Wesley up high enough that I could see him, and I got the first look at him, and at that moment I knew, I knew that my son was not going to have a, tip a typical life. Before Adrian can even see her newborn son, whom they have named Wesley, doctors rush him to the neonatal ICU. Adrian called me over and asked me to describe to her what I had seen. That was very hard to do. It's not good. It doesn't look good. For the last five months, Adrian and Mark Beck have been plagued with worry about whether or not their unborn son has a serious genetic defect. When he's born, doctors immediately rush him to the intensive care unit. It is hours before Adrian is allowed to see him. So at about two o'clock in the morning, they came and got me and let me go and see him. And, um, and he looked sick. He definitely looked sick. Wesley's hands and feet are twisted and curled. His facial features have a distinctly strange look to them. They also discover that the newborn has no suck-swallow response. He won't be able to nurse or drink from a bottle, so he must be given a feeding tube. I wanted so much to know what was wrong with him. I welcomed anyone who maybe had an opinion or had an idea. Soon after birth, a geneticist is called to check Wesley out. He draws blood and runs a battery of tests. Later, he comes back to share his findings with Adrian. As I was driving out to pick up the children, the phone rang. It was Adrian, and Adrian was very upset and was crying. They had a chance to look over Wesley, and he said he thought from the way Wesley looked that it looked like he had a syndrome called Zellweger's disease. Zellweger syndrome is a rare genetic disease where the body's cells can't expel toxins, which build up in the brain and other organs. Infants with Zellweger's usually die from respiratory distress, internal bleeding, or liver failure. The prognosis that he gave was that Wesley wouldn't live until he was six months old. That would be the longest that he would live. Although the geneticist is pretty certain, he still has to order a test to confirm the diagnosis. It will take two months to get the results. The Becks are devastated, 
If, as they have been told, Wesley is going to die in less than a year, they want his life, however short, to be full of family, not hospital equipment. So, after a little over a week, his parents bring him home. So for the first several months of Wesley's life, we felt it was important to hold him all the time, 24-7. And although we didn't know how long we were going to have him, we wanted to have him as long as possible. I definitely felt like I was a first-time mom again. I felt like I couldn't do anything right. So that was really difficult. He is such a sweet little boy. Then, finally, the Zellweger tests come back. And lo and behold, results say this is not a case of Zellweger syndrome. It was a pretty sweet moment, the relief that flooded out of me, you know. We just felt like, OK, this kid has a chance. We went ahead and just decided we were going to treat him like the rest of our children. But clearly, Wesley is different from the other children. And the Becks are certain the answers are out there. OK, it's not Zellweger's. What is it? And so more blood was drawn, and the tests were started again. As the days turn into months, the Becks find themselves spending more and more time in the geneticist's office. I remember sitting in his office one day, and he would pop out of the office to go look something up. He'd come back in and say, does Wesley have fat lips? And we'd look at his lips for a minute, and he'd say, no, he doesn't have fat lips. And he'd come back and say, do Wesley's fingernails do this or that? At the end of that, uh, he said, you know, I think the best thing to do is just let's wait six months. But waiting is not good enough for the Becks. They continue seeing specialist after specialist to try to figure out how to help their son. Orthopedics and geneticists and others. And the bottom line was they did not know what was going on here. Still, despite the grim prognosis he was given at birth, seven-month-old Wesley seems to be thriving. He's put on weight and is rolling over. In August, he smiled for the first time. And that was a tremendous relief to us because the neurologist had told us that smiling would be a, a good indication that his mental capabilities would, would be good. Although Wesley has lived longer than doctors ever expected, the Becks still don't have a diagnosis. So in November 2004, they turned to a new geneticist, Dr. Joan Stoller at Massachusetts General Hospital. When I met Dr. Stoller, my impression of the medical professionals at this point was pretty low. They wanted a diagnosis and they wanted to continue, but I'm sure they were very tired of the whole process. She asked a lot of questions and reviewed his history. When he was born, the features that he had were somewhat distinctive, but his skin was really what struck me, and somewhat of the sort of the gestalt of his face, but not at that point indicative of a particular disorder. Dr. Stoller orders x-rays to check for skeletal malformations and takes photographs of Wesley's strange features. She said, OK, I'll, I'll look into this and we'll see what we can do. When I first saw Wesley, I was thinking that perhaps he did have a type of skeletal dysplasia, type of dwarfing condition. The x-rays turned out to be fine, and I started to look up different things. We have a couple of computer programs and also lots of books. And I said, OK, if I put in this deformity of the hands, the short stature, and this thick skin, what do I come up with? What else could this be? And then it just came to my head. Down syndrome, dwarfism, Zellweger syndrome. Since before he was born, Wesley Beck's parents have been tortured with terrible misdiagnoses of their son's mysterious condition. The entire experience was a major roller coaster ride. But after a series of tests and a detailed analysis of Wesley's condition, geneticist Dr. Joan Stoller believes she's finally hit on a diagnosis for this seven month old baby. She called me up and said, You know, I, I think that he has this syndrome called Costello syndrome. Costello syndrome is a rare genetic disorder diagnosed in around 250 people worldwide. In Costello, scientists believe that a defective gene relays faulty information to cells in the body, causing certain organ systems to develop abnormally. This in turn leads to the distinctive facial features, delayed cognitive development, short stature, and loose skin on misshapen hands and feet. My first reaction to this news was fairly cynical. But then I went on the internet and found a website. It had pictures 
of, of babies who had Costello syndrome. And I think we didn't take very long for us to believe that Wesley was in fact um, a, a, a baby who had Costello syndrome. Geneticists believe that the defective gene also puts a Costello child at greater risk for heart problems and cancer. We don't know exactly how that works because the gene has just been found, but it obviously involves many different organ systems. It involves the skin, it involves the lungs, it involves the heart, and also it has a propensity for tumor development. There is no cure for Costello syndrome, but vigilant medical care can help monitor and treat any complication that may appear. It's a rare diagnosis, so we don't have a lot of information about the lifespan of people with Costello syndrome. We do know that people can live into young adulthood. Before we got the Costello diagnosis, we didn't know if he was going to live or if he was going to die, and Costello syndrome was, like, huge. Today, Wesley, now almost two, is the joy of his family's life. Wesley today is just a sweet little boy. He is stronger. He can let you know what he wants. He has a terrific smile. It just lights up his whole face. Uh, he will make developmental gains. He will be able to walk and talk. He will be able to enjoy things. My son's going to walk. He's going to talk. I remember thinking he's going to put his little arms around me and give me a hug someday. The Becks are happy to finally have an answer, but still wonder why the road to the right diagnosis was so long and filled with so many false leads. I think making diagnoses like this is often being a detective. One has to take the pieces of the puzzle put together or to try to make a pattern of the different features. And making a diagnosis in utero is even harder. During pregnancy, we have ultrasounds where we can only tell so much. I don't think anyone in their mind would have thought about Costello syndrome at that point. I have always been in awe of a doctor, but this experience has taught me that they're relying on things that aren't 100% reliable. I've learned a lot about how the medical profession operates, and more often than not, the answer is that we don't know. So you got to push back. you got to ask hard questions. Even before he was born, doctors suspected Wesley Beck would have problems. But in 1987, Stephanie Fox is a healthy college student when she comes down with something that seems like a typical bug. Stephanie came home from college one Thanksgiving. She didn't feel well, she had a cold. I got extremely ill, very high fever. I just was having trouble even getting out of bed. She just looked very pale and, and a, a little bit on the frail side. And I got better maybe a week later, went back to school. I thought it was just the flu. I didn't think it was anything significant. At school, Stephanie starts dating Josh Kaplan. And soon, Josh can't help but notice that Stephanie doesn't seem quite right. There were, there were moments when I was first getting to know her where she would just sort of lose energy. It would come out of the blue. She would be running around, doing something, going to classes. And then the next thing I knew, Stephanie would be not feeling well just thought that I was prone to getting ill. It didn't really dawn on me that there was anything significantly wrong. But a few months later, she begins to experience symptoms more alarming than fatigue or the flu. I started getting feet and leg cramps very often. You could just watch her feet tense and her toes stand up and being rigid. Worried for the first time, Stephanie goes to see the on-campus doctors, but they can't find anything wrong with her. I don't think at that time anybody thought it was unusual. You know, a typical college student wasn't getting enough sleep, was studying, and just the uh, immune system was down. The fatigue, frequent illness, and muscle cramping continue on and off. Following the doctor's lead, Stephanie tries not to worry. But then she notices another strange problem. In 1988, really, at the beginning of the year, I started to lose my sex drive and my libido. And it became a very significant part of our relationship because I couldn't explain why I had no sexual desire at all. I, I didn't really know what to make of it. Totally confused, very frustrated, in, in every definition of that word. Despite this, Josh and Stephanie are in love and make plans to get married right after graduation. But Stephanie is tortured by her non-existent libido and wants to clear it up before the wedding. So she makes an appointment with a gynecologist. I told her that I had lost my sex drive completely and was very baffled by it. 
that doctor who said it's pre-wedding jitters. You need to just get over it. I figured she's a doctor. She knows what she's talking about. And maybe I'm just nervous, and everything will go back to normal after the wedding. But it doesn't. In fact, everything, the colds, the fatigue, the cramping, is all getting worse. Then Josh notices a new bizarre development. She seemed to be putting on weight. Her stomach around her, her midsection got large and, and not, not normal. It's just weird. I, I couldn't believe it. She looked like she was four months pregnant or six months pregnant. She just, she was just huge. But Stephanie doesn't see it. When you see yourself in the mirror every day and you're gaining some weight, it really, believe it or not, didn't set any alarms off in my head that something was wrong. A new symptom, though, does grab Stephanie's attention. I stopped menstruating really in the fall of 1989. I knew at that point that something was wrong. Alarmed, Stephanie heads back to the doctors. I went to see many, many different doctors to try to figure out why did my period stop? Why was my libido the way that it was? Why were my legs cramping? She was seeing her general practitioner. I went to a neurologist. She was seeing her gynecologist. I went to many internal medicine doctors. After weeks of testing and examinations, no one can find anything wrong. I was told by one that it was all in my head. You start to doubt yourself after a while. My gosh, maybe I am a hypochondriac. Maybe there really isn't anything significantly wrong. But then, in January of 1990, something else develops, something very weird. I started to have yellow skin. Well, it was just a, a yellowish tint to her. My eyes were yellow. Not really dark, but just that they weren't a normal color. It wasn't something that threw a red flag, because when you see someone every day, you don't necessarily recognize that something's wrong with them. Finally, though, Josh has had enough of Stephanie's laid-back attitude. And then there was one morning when she was on the phone with her doctor, and I kept nagging at her. I kept saying, tell the doctor your eyes are yellow. And she kept pushing me away. Tell the doctor your eyes are yellow, pushing me away. And finally she said, Josh wants me to tell you my eyes are yellow. And that's when the doctor said, I need to see you in the hospital, and I'll meet you there in 10 minutes. Muscle cramps, flu and fatigue, lack of sex drive. For the past three years, Stephanie Kaplan has been suffering from vague symptoms that don't seem all that dangerous. But in early 1990, when her skin and eyes take on a yellow hue, her doctor tells her to get to the hospital immediately. We literally picked up, went to the hospital, and they started running tests. I was scared. I think adrenaline started to kick in a little bit to say, let's figure out what's wrong and get me out of there as soon as possible. But Stephanie must be admitted for observation until her tests come back. And when they do, they're shocking. I was diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis. Autoimmune hepatitis is a chronic disease where the immune system attacks the liver. The liver is the body's detoxifier. When it isn't working right, toxins can build up, tinting the skin and eyes. And that's why I turned yellow because my body was poisoning itself because my liver wasn't working. The doctor tells Stephanie that autoimmune hepatitis can be treated with drugs that suppress the immune system. But then he raises another concern. Stephanie's bloated stomach suggests to him that she may have another chronic autoimmune condition, Crohn's disease. With Crohn's, the immune system attacks the intestines, leading to a host of potential complications. He discharges her and recommends that she see a gastroenterologist. My mom was completely panicked because she had watched her mother die of Crohn's disease. And I became the mother lion, so to speak. And I said to my husband, I'm calling the Crohn's Association to find out what doctors are available. My mom got a referral to one of the best Crohn's specialists in Los Angeles, who was Dr. Edward Feldman at Cedar sinai Stephanie was very ill. Uh, that was uh, clear from the moment she came in. Dr. Feldman orders x-rays and blood work to confirm the Crohn's diagnosis so he can start treatment right away. But when the tests come back, he is shocked. By looking at her x-rays, there was no good evidence that she had Crohn's disease. 
But on the other hand, the blood test results were, were quite striking. The blood tests show Stephanie has elevated liver enzymes, an indication that her liver has deteriorated. Her liver was clearly failing. Could she have lived a few more days, a few more weeks? Probably. A few more months? Unlikely. Knowing other diseases can mimic autoimmune hepatitis, Stephanie's earlier diagnosis, Dr. Feldman calls Dr. John Veerling, an expert in liver disorders. Stephanie's uh, level of liver dysfunction was so severe that if we were not able to establish a diagnosis, immediately her only option was going to be a liver transplantation. Stephanie is admitted to the hospital immediately, and her family rushes to her side. Stephanie looked like death. She was gray. She was weak, extremely weak. She didn't look like she was going to make it. They were doing different scans. They had her in and out of the room. It, it seemed like it was just a never-ending series of tests. She was in, in terrible pain, and that was really the first time I'd ever really seen her in, in just really excruciating pain. Her body had just stopped functioning, and she didn't have much time. Dr. Veerling knows he must get answers fast, but first he needs to get a closer look at the liver tissue, so he orders an immediate liver biopsy. I was a little bit nervous going in for the biopsy. A liver biopsy is normally a routine procedure done directly through the skin into the liver, but the liver dysfunction has caused Stephanie's blood to stop clotting. Doctors know the standard method could lead to massive internal bleeding and they can't risk it. Our only alternative was to puncture the jugular vein in the neck and to thread a catheter down past the heart to the interior of the liver to obtain a biopsy. I just remember holding Josh's hand as I was being rolled down to the operating room and just looking into his eyes and saying, I love you, and hoping that that wasn't the last time that I would be able to tell him that. As the biopsy equipment was being threaded toward its target, it actually collapsed the right lung. Doctors work quickly to stabilize Stephanie, but the biopsy is aborted before they can get a specimen. This was a very significant setback in what was already uh, a very sick young woman. For the past three years, Stephanie Kaplan has been suffering from mysterious symptoms. Now she is in the hospital with severe liver failure, and doctors are racing against the clock to uncover the exact cause. She was slipping into liver failure, which leads to coma, which leads to death. But with a biopsy now out of the question, Veerling and Feldman head back to the drawing board to find a way to diagnose Stephanie's problem before it's too late. I ordered three tests. The first was at ceruloplasma, which is measuring the amount of a protein in the blood. One was a 24-hour urine collection. The other test was to ask an ophthalmologist to look in the clear portion of the eye called the cornea. With liver disease, symptoms will sometimes manifest in the eyes. Dr. Veerling hopes Stephanie's eyes may offer some clue as to what's killing her. The ophthalmologist found that I had copper rings in my eyes. And when the results from the other two tests come back, they tell the same story. The blood work showed that I had excess copper in my system. Putting all the pieces of this puzzle together, it added up that she had excessive amounts of copper, and it was accumulating in her liver and causing her to be very ill. I believe strongly that the diagnosis was Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease is a rare genetic disorder where the liver can't rid itself of copper, a mineral found in many foods we eat. Eventually, the copper gets into the bloodstream, accumulates in various organs, including the brain, corneas, and kidneys, and interferes with organ function. If it's not diagnosed and treated, Wilson's disease is fatal. So this copper accumulates and causes damage by replacing normal tissue. Copper accumulation can also cause damage to the nervous system, leading to muscle cramping, and can alter hormone levels. The fact that the liver was not functioning normal is undoubtedly the explanation for why she suffered loss of libido, 
ultimately stopped menstruating. There is no cure for Wilson's disease, but it can be managed with medications. Doctors immediately begin Stephanie on treatment. We used a drug that binds with copper and takes it out of the body through the urine. Within hours, Stephanie sees what has been poisoning her for years. Copper basically started pouring out of my body. And Stephanie also finds out why it took so long for doctors to solve the mystery. Well, Stephanie's experience was actually fairly typical for patients with Wilson's disease, where often the earliest times of symptoms are not really recognized as being due to this disease. After Stephanie started taking the medicine that they had prescribed, things started getting better pretty quickly. Within several months, her life started returning to normal. And it was so wonderful to see the Stephanie that I knew come back. Today, a daily dose of medication is Stephanie's only reminder of how close she came to dying. Stephanie's doing great today. As long as Stephanie stays on her medication, she's going to be wonderful. After this diagnosis, we were able to really put our marriage, our sex life, and everything else on a track of where we wanted to go. Our life together now is absolutely 100% normal. I think that I will have a bond with these doctors for the rest of my life because I credit them with saving my life. Stephanie Kaplan's illness started when she was in college. But Scott Gobers started when he was just a little boy, obsessed with sports. Well, he was extremely quick and um, very well coordinated and a star. I would say a star of the team and every, everything that he did. But in 1978, 12-year-old Scott develops intense pain that literally stops him in his tracks. I would always race my friend, and I'd beat him hands down. And I remember one time we were racing outside, and just halfway through it had to stop, immediately stop. There was such intense pain in my hands and feet that I couldn't even think, uh, let alone run. And he came and he said, Mom, I cannot run. My feet hurt me so badly. And it was as if, as if you put your hands and feet in an oven and then poured hot oil over them. The pain doesn't let up, so the family heads to their pediatrician's office. The first time we took Scott to the pediatrician, uh, the pediatrician said that he had growing pains and said it would probably come and go for a period of time. But Scott's pain doesn't come and go. It intensifies. Then we took him to a rheumatologist and another very well-known rheumatologist. They mostly did blood tests. Based on the type of pain, the pediatric rheumatologist diagnoses him with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, an inflammatory disease of the joints. The treatment that was first prescribed to me was taking many, many aspirin a day, up to 12 aspirin a day throughout the course of the day. But aspirin treatment doesn't help. When this pain didn't get any better, we then went on to a pediatric group and then to a pediatric endocrinologist, then a podiatrist because it was in his feet. You know, we just couldn't figure it out. Anytime I went to an appointment, there was, you know, many, many, many tubes of blood that were taken. So they take a vial and they take another vial and, and it'd be maybe five or six vials of blood. I felt like there were vampires coming and taking my blood and I had to sit there and just take it. But after dozens of blood tests, no one has any answers. And when he enters high school, Scott develops a new problem, severe gastrointestinal pain, especially after he eats. Scott would get up in the morning and he never wanted to eat. He just said, I don't want to eat. I remember very vividly my parents in the room saying, you know, stop playing games. You know, you really just needed to eat. I was running to the bathroom constantly. And when you're in high school, it's hard to, you know, run out of class uh, and, and run to the bathroom. We took Scott to a gastroenterologist, and he kept saying it was temporary and it would go away. But none of it, the joint pain nor the stomach problems, subside, and the Gober's frustration mounts. It was very hard to look at Scott and to know he was in pain and to not be able to have a definite answer. Desperate, the Gobers turned to a different source. After uh, we had gone through a lot of sort of the quote unquote Western medical profession, my mom was fairly fed up and she felt that maybe we should look at some Eastern or so holistic medicine. They experiment with pressure points and special herbal drinks. He seemed to feel better for a while, but then it always came back.
After five years with no relief, Scott's physicians begin insinuating that he's exaggerating his problems, which adds another dimension to his pain. To have the doctors say to me, more or less, that I was faking it was, it was an affront. It, was, it just felt horrible. I felt that maybe I was just causing everyone else problems when I shouldn't. At age 17, Scott finally reaches his breaking point and refuses to see any more doctors. When I actually went to my parents and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I wasn't going to wake up someday and things were going to change. It's, I didn't believe that. For over six years, Scott Gober has endured intense joint pain and horrible gastrointestinal problems. With no relief from countless doctor visits, he vows to keep his never-ending pain to himself. I would always ask Scott how he was feeling, and he would always say, fine, very curt and very fine. Everything's fine. Now in college, Scott pushes himself to stay active through sports. I would grin and bear it um, every day, every second. Anytime I was doing anything more than walking, any kind of physical exertion. He would make mention that he might be a little tired or, boy, I'm exhausted, uh, I feel sick to my stomach. But he would kind of gloss over it because his performance while playing would never reflect any of that. But in the heat of competition, his friends notice he has an even stranger condition. He doesn't sweat. We'd go back to the locker room and we would be showering and everyone would look like they've already showered because they were out there playing and, and I was bone dry. So where most other people would need to shower after playing or towel off, Scott looks fresh as a daisy. It just seemed like one of those things that, you know, was specific to Scott and just a little unusual. I would joke it off or I would sort of just walk away, really. I just didn't think that maybe there was something wrong with me at that point. After college, Scott continues to downplay his symptoms, even to his girlfriend, Daniela Saunders. When Scott told me that he had these conditions, we, we kind of joked about it. And I just thought, well, he's a special person and he has special conditions. I, I didn't really think anything of it. But after they marry, one condition Daniela can't ignore are Scott's rashes. It was when Scott and I were dating that I noticed he had these red marks on his hands. And he said that they had developed in college. Initially, it would just be more blotchy red and then it became more pronounced and it actually would turn black. I actually thought I had splinters in my hands and I would dig them out and, and get rid of them. And he said like they showed them to a dermatologist and that the dermatologist said that it was nothing. The dermatologist would, would look at it, look at it, look at it and really just came to the conclusion that, it, that they don't know what it is and there was not much they can do. After over 20 years since the onset of his symptoms, it is the birth of Scott's son that makes him look again at his health. In my mid-30s, uh, after we had our first child, uh, my wife and I sat down and said we needed to plan for the future, and life insurance policy seemed like the way to protect our family. And as part of that, we both got health screenings. For Scott, it involved taking blood and urine. And then you wait two weeks, so I'm waiting, and I get a call from our, our broker. The broker not only says, am I not getting my policy, but I have this issue where I'm seeing protein in the urine and that, you know, my health is a real, real concern, and there's something at issue here. So I went on the internet and I did some research about protein in the urine and they said it was kidney related. Protein in the urine can be a symptom of many serious diseases, from lupus to acute kidney failure. Daniela realizes she needs to get Scott in to see someone as quickly as possible. So she makes an appointment with Dr. Albert Madelon of the New York University Nephrology Department. Sometimes you can eyeball a person and have an, a good idea of what you're dealing with. In Scott's case, he came in looking so good, looking young, healthy, that the immediate thought is that he's not going to have any kind of disease and certainly nothing that's going to end up being very serious. But then Scott starts listing his symptoms. Intense uh, pain in my hands and feet, constant pain in, my, in the rest of my joints, shoulders, knees, ankles. I had um, constantly either diarrhea or vomiting, one or the other. And I asked him, have you had any rashes? He says, like this? And he showed me the palms of his hands, which were covered with bright red spots. And I was taken aback. I had never seen anything like this before in my life. I said, when did that happen? He said, I've had this for over 20 years. Over 20 years? What were you thinking? I didn't know what the diagnosis could be. But I felt the only way we were going to get the diagnosis was with the kidney biopsy. I put a big needle in his back and press the button, and a spring-loaded mechanism takes a little squiggle of kidney out. He sends the sample to the lab, and Scott, now hospitalized, waits for the results. 
And Dr. Madelon called me up and said, hey, you know, good news and bad news. The bad news, you can't get out of the hospital just yet. But the good news is we think we found out what you have. Based on the biopsy results, Dr. Madelon consults with Dr. Greg Pastores in the neurogenetics lab. Eager to question Scott and see these findings, Dr. Pastores rushes to his hospital room. So we're in the hospital room with Scott, and Dr. Pastores comes in. And he starts asking Scott very specific questions. So I asked him whether he experienced pain in his hands and feet, whether he had any peculiar rashes, whether he experienced fatigue, whether he did sweat or not at all. And he reeled them off, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I checked every one of them mentally in my head, and I was sort of dizzy because I, I, it was just the most amazing thing because all these things were compartmentalized in my mind of symptoms for things that I had, but nothing that I thought uh, were related. Dr. Pastores has a hunch he knows what's been ailing Scott for so long, but he needs another test to confirm. The blood test confirmed our suspicion that Scott had a deficiency of alpha-galactosidase A. Alpha-galactosidase A is an enzyme that regulates a specific fatty material called GL3 found in some cells. With the results confirmed, Dr. Pastores can now make an official diagnosis. The enzyme uh, for which Scott is deficient is the cause of a disorder known as Fabry disease. Fabry disease is a metabolic disorder in which sufferers are lacking the enzyme alpha-galactosidase A. Without this enzyme, fatty materials build up in the cells of blood vessels, nerves, and other organs, causing rashes, joint pain, gastrointestinal problems, and dysfunctional sweat glands. It is rare, found in roughly 1 in 120,000 people. I knew Fabry disease can cause kidney failure, but I never expected to see it, and it's the kind of thing that I expected only to find in my textbooks. Over time, the affected cells can lead to strokes, heart and kidney failure, and ultimately, death. Scott was essentially entering a stage not only of chronic renal insufficiency, but impending renal failure. If I had not gotten the diagnosis of Fabry at that time, I would have had kidney failure. I would have been going to work one day, and then all of a sudden, it'll just fail. There is no cure for Fabry disease, but lucky for Scott, in April of 2003, the FDA approved a new treatment that helps those afflicted with the disease live rich, full lives. But the treatment for Fabry is a, it's called an enzyme replacement therapy, ERT, and it's essentially they create an enzyme, synthetic, and they inject it in you every two weeks for the rest of your life, and I get it at home. Today, Scott is doing great. His joint pain, stomach issues, and other symptoms have lessened or disappeared completely. And the prospect of imminent kidney failure has virtually disappeared. Enzyme replacement therapy is a true miracle because not only does it halt the disease in its tracks, but actually restores function. Which to me says, you know, I'm going to be alive for a while. And so to me, that's, it's wonderful. Individuals with Fabry disease, unfortunately, often have either a miss or a delayed diagnosis for an extended period of time because in isolation, most of their problems can be found in the general population. But Scott now knows that ignoring his symptoms for over 20 years almost killed him. The biggest message is, you know, get in there and, and take things seriously and, you know, don't build up walls and hide behind things. Well, medicine is phenomenal. I'm living proof that because of this advancement in medicine, I'll most likely be able to live a normal life.